because it's sort of like, well, you're not doing it for yourself. You're, you're doing it for other people, so you're not being true to yourself. Uh, and so, so, so culture can influence the meaning of certain goals, right? Um, and, and the kind of goals that are desirable. Um, and I think another interesting uh, last example that, that I'll, I'll just share is um, the researchers have looked at identity consistency. So this is the idea of the kind of person that you are when, when you're with your family, when, when you're with your mother, your, your, your friends, a stranger, a uh, work colleague. Um, so in the West, uh, identity consistency is something that is, is valued. If you're, you're supposed to be an individual, you're supposed to be unique. A unique person with a coherent identity across different social situations. So, so, so having being a consistent or behaving consistently with different people is actually a predictor of well-being. So, the more consistent your identity is, the the higher your levels of well-being. But when they look at Asians, they find that identity consistency doesn't really predict well-being as much. Uh, and it makes sense because in a lot of uh, you know in in a lot of Asian cultures. Um, you know, this idea of being the exact same person or behaving the exact same way with everybody that you're with doesn't really make sense, right? Like, like you know, you're expected to adjust your behavior depending on the social role, depending on the norms. So, so being the same person that you are with your mother versus your friend versus your supervisor versus your strangers is, is, is not something that, that is really valued or expected uh, in, in this context. And, and because of that, even though Asians may not be you know, consistent, like, for, for, with every single person that they're with, that doesn't necessarily have a, a negative impact on their well-being. Um, so, so these are just some examples of, of how uh, our cultural values, uh, our cultural norms uh, can influence our, our well-being. Thank you, Will. So we can see that there are cultural differences in the types of positive emotions that people value, say, low arousal, positive emotions versus high arousal positive emotions. So they're not all equal just because they're positive emotions. Right? So there are also different cultural differences in what matters to people's happiness across um, different cultures. So what about within a culture? So would people within a culture be more similar? Or would there still be differences among them? How would the use of different languages within a culture affect how people interpret and understand the concept of happiness. I will answer this question. Um, I recently done a research. Um, what I did is I collected, um, you know, a hundred, um, about a hundred articles from Lianhe Zaobao and from Straits Time. Uh, these articles are written, were written either by the uh, uh, you know, readers who wrote in, the forum letters or editors or journalists. So they share their view on um, happiness. So um, this is the data I've collected and you notice that um, when English, uh, writer, English, English speakers um, write in or write about their feeling, their view towards happiness, they tend to use happy more often than happiness. Whereas when Chinese-speaking um, uh, readers or, you know, uh, community, when they express their views, definitely, you know, um, um, they, they unanimously use xinfu as, you know, uh, as the word to express themselves. And kuai le is the next one. So, um, as you know that, um, um, obviously, here, this there's a difference, there's a subtle difference in their expression of happiness or expression of their attitudes towards happiness. And we, as we, you know, that as just now Dr. Uh, Will has, uh, has um, shared that um, people from different culture really have different feelings, um, you know, uh, um, cultures affects their way. And similarly, that um, the language they use also affects the way they think, especially when they express their, um, their emotion. There are, um, within 
you know, in different languages, there are universal concepts that you know you definitely you you, you have ha you can be anger. Uh, you, there's anger there. There's happy. You know, you can be happy. But then there are also terms that are very culturally specific. Um, so you can't just um, equate one cultural specific term um, in happiness or you know in emotion to another one. So here, when you look at this, you will see that. Um, yeah, um, in fact, from just from this table alone or from this data analysis alone, uh, a, a simple conclusion can be drawn is that um, um, uh, English, English speaking uh, speakers tends to focus more on the action of achieving happiness because more tends to use the adjective, you know, whereas the, um, the, the Chinese speaking uh, communities, they tend to look at the status. The, the status or the, 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 the inner uh, being pertaining to happiness. And I will share more later on uh, towards the, uh, about the uh, different attitude. Okay, I think we have quite thoroughly examined how happiness is defined. So now another question that most of us will be interested in would be, can well-being be measured? Okay, Weixian, are there any indicators that we can use to assess mental health? <clears throat> um, so in terms of indicators, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll start off with the individual level um, and with negative mental health because clearly that's what I'm a little bit more familiar with. Um, so on the individual level, um, we do have tools, uh, instruments that help us to make um, uh, more standardized and, and quasi-objective uh, assessments of negative mental health conditions or mental illnesses. Uh, so these tend to be questionnaires. Um, so you might have heard of the Beck Depression Inventory, um, the Young Mania Rating Scale, Yale Brown uh, Obsessive Compulsive Scale. So as I mentioned, these are essentially questionnaires. And why do I say they are quasi-objective only instead of truly objective? Um, because there's always a sub subjective uh, element to such uh, uh, responses from, to such questionnaires. So for instance, a back depression inventory is, is what we call a self-rating scale. So in other words, the person being assessed gives us all the feedback uh, based on his or her perspective. So we also have clinician rating scales where a doctor, a nurse or another health professional uh, will, make, will, will, will fill up the questionnaire and um, basically give ratings based on his or her observation of the person being assessed. Uh, but even then, it is still uh, subject to some degree of subjectivity because um, uh, I guess different assessors have different thresholds. So for instance, uh, I'll, I'll just use the example of psychomotor retardation, which is a, a very classic sign of depression. Uh, this refers to a general slowing down of uh, thought processes and movements uh, due to the depressive illness. So the de how, how, much, how much of a slowing uh, qualifies as psychomotor retardation, again, it can vary uh, from clinician to clinician. So even then, there is some degree of subjectivity. Um, as for positive mental health, uh, on the individual level, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, tool that's used on a large scale or on a routine basis um, to assess positive mental health. Um, but I'm, I am aware that they validated tools like the Satisfaction of Life Scale, uh, which is usually used in a research setting. So on the population level, I guess, uh, if you want to talk about population indicators, um, I guess uh, one way to, to uh, infer the state of positive mental health in the population probably would be to aggregate the measures of maybe a sample or, or various uh, um, uh, tools that you use to assess uh, individual po uh, positive mental health. It has, as for negative mental health, as I mentioned earlier, um, is usually inferred uh, based on statistics about prevalence and illness burden of mental illnesses. Thank you, Vishen. So, psychology has pioneered the scientific study of well-being, and presumably that would mean that there is some way of measuring well-being. So, Will, can you tell us, can happiness be measured? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, it depends on you know how you define happiness and well-being, um, but I, if we're thinking about cross-culturally, can we measure can we measure this concept across the world? I think you know there's pretty good evidence that you know at least when we're talking about life satisfaction or life evaluation, um, that uh, you know that these questions translate fairly well across cultures. So so they do these studies where, for example, you have like French Canadians rate their life satisfaction in France, right? So we're talking about people in like Quebec, 
right, Montreal. Um, and you compare their life satisfaction with English-speaking Canadians, right, so other people living in the same country. Uh, and you can compare the life satisfaction with French people in France, right, so in Paris. Okay, so they're speaking the same language. So the question is, uh, which group are the French Canadians more similar to, right? Is their life satisfaction more similar to English-speaking Canadians who are living in the same country or French-speaking people in France who speak the same language? And it turns out that their life satisfaction is closer to English-speaking Canadians, right? Which, which is, is what you expect if people are thinking about their life circumstances, they're thinking about their living conditions when they answer these questions. They've done similar studies uh, in Singapore, India, uh, China as well, they, where they have participants rate their, their, their life satisfaction in English or, or in a local language like Mandarin or, or Tamil. And, and generally you find that uh, whatever language is being used, people's life satisfaction is more similar to the other people who are living in the same country. Um, so, so to me, that, that gives me some hope that, that, you know, that this concept is, is being translated across languages. I think even better evidence for, for the validity of these measures is that, you know, when we measure life satisfaction in all these countries around the world, you get meaningful results. So for example, uh, life satisfaction tends to be lowest in the poorest countries in Africa, like Burundi, Tanzania. They're also very low. Uh, life satisfaction is also very low in countries that are politically unstable, like Syria. Um, and life satisfaction is highest in, in these northern European countries that are not just wealthy, but also have a lot of social welfare programs. They're very stable. Um, so, so these meaningful patterns um, suggest to me that even though everybody around the world is maybe speaking a different language, that there's something, there's a common understanding of what well-being is. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't any cultural differences. Um, like I mentioned before, there are cultural differences in what people want to feel. There are cultural differences in the things that predict well-being. Um, but I, my take is that, <clears throat> you know, if we're talking about at a very general level, right, I think at a general level, everybody around the world understands what it means to feel good. Um, they understand how to evaluate whether or not they're getting the things that they want or need in life. Um, but I think as we go down to a more specific level, right, so, so the specific kinds of positive emotions, the specific kinds of feelings that people want to have, uh, and the specific things that make people happy, then you see more and more cultural differences. Thank you. So the research from psychology seems to suggest that the scales and measures used to assess well-being are robust and valid. So they can be used across nations, across cultures. They can be translated into different languages. But Susan, do you think there will be differences in the attitudes of English-speaking versus Chinese-speaking communities towards, the, um, towards happiness? As this table has shown, there's, you know, just from uh, the use of uh, different expressions to express your view or, um, towards happiness, there are differences there. And from this table, um, you know, the distribution, you'll be able to see that, in fact, um, kuai le in Chinese seems to be more equivalent to happy in, or happiness in English in terms of its usage as, you know, kuai le is used more as a kind of word to describe the status, the mood and emotion of the people, whereas happiness, uh, xinfu, is more um, used as a noun to describe a kind of a long-term uh, contentment. Okay, um, next I would like to share that um, through my you know, um, analysis, um, we noticed that um, um, there are subtle differences um, in terms of the interpretation of uh, happiness between the English-speaking uh, community and the Chinese-speaking community. For example, for English-speaking community, um, happiness is not a completely positive um, expression. You know, um, from the articles or from the essays, the forum letters they wrote, you can see that there are negative um, expressions like, you know, the soft side of it, the flip side of this happiness. You know, happiness can be bought, you know, purchase of happiness, you know, or pursuit of happiness can lead to, um, you know, negative results. So you can see that um, the emotion related or linked to happiness is not always positive. Whereas if you uh, look at the uh, xinfu, uh, 
in the letters or in the uh, essays um, written by the uh, Chinese speakers, then you notice that it's purely, it's highly positive. There's no negative feeling towards um, Xinfu. Okay, so this this subtle difference. So that's why when uh, psychologists feel that this um, Xinfu or uh, happiness can be measured, whereas you know. In a context, in a culture that value Xinfu totally, completely uh, positive, sometimes it's very hard to measure. Um, and also that um, when um, the English speaker express their views on trans, uh, on on happiness, they tend to be quite objective. Surprisingly, they tend to express their view, their understanding of happiness through their observation of others. You know how other fears about uh, fear about. In um, um, happiness, whereas for the Chinese speaking uh, speakers, they tend to um, speak uh, from their own uh, personal experience, their own feeling, and then they tend to use a lot of comparative or superlative things, and then they tend the words they use are mainly, you know, uh, reflect their own mental process or cognitive status rather than the English speaker. Whereas the English speakers, they tend to use, you know, kind kind of material words, you know, action word that can be. Um, can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, happiness can be achieved, you know. So that's more like action packed, whereas uh, Chinese one is like more spiritually related, you know, it's only like I can feel, you can't feel, I can only tell how I feel it. So that's the differences um, in the understanding. And also, um, there's also a subtle um, difference between. Um, the, 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 the duration. For happiness, it seems like, um, you know, um, uh, it, it can be achieved. Um, just for that moment, you know, it can vary from time to time. Whereas Xinfu in Chinese seems to last longer. It has, a, you know, a long-term uh, kind of relationship, and uh, you know, it, it emphasizes it emphasizes on the um, uh, and continuity. Yeah. So that's my um, basic understanding of the differences between the two groups of uh, speakers in Singapore. Thank you, Susan. All right. So now the next question is probably something that is closer to home. So in the 2016 World Happiness Report, Singapore was ranked 20, 22 out of 157 countries in terms of life satisfaction. So it was the happiest country, uh, nation in Asia. Okay. And in the recent 2017 World Happiness Report, it was just released like a couple of weeks ago. We dropped four ranks. So now we're 26 out of 155 countries. But don't worry, we are still the happiest nation in Asia. So we, have, we, have, we still have the top spot. Right? So the results would suggest that Singaporeans are generally satisfied with their lives. Right? We are ranked pretty high. Right? So Will, would you be able to share with us, in general, what are some of the factors that could contribute to our levels or that could influence our levels of happiness? Yeah, so so we should qualify that. Uh, uh, you know, when 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 we're saying that Singapore ranks the highest in Asia, <coughs> it is it is on its measure of cognitive uh, cognitive well-being, right? So life satisfaction. Um, you know, like uh, several years ago, I mean, there's this reaction in Denmark because Denmark um, Denmark also tends to rank very high in terms of life satisfaction, but uh, you know, because because the term life satisfaction sounds very wordy and, and you know happiness is just much more intuitive like um, the news reports tend to tend to talk about how Denmark's the happiest country in the world and but you talk to Danish people and they, they disagree with that because when they go on the the subway they don't see people smiling and it's it's because they're measuring life satisfaction which is a particular kind of well-being right it's not the, the happy happy cheerful positive emotion kind of happiness um, which Denmark Still ranks pretty high on, but not in the top ten. Actually, it's a little bit lower. Um, so, so, so Singapore is very high in life satisfaction in terms of positive emotions. Uh, you know, it, it fluctuates a bit. It's more middle of the pack. Okay, although there was that one year where Singapore was like all the way down there, along with Iraq. But then <laughs> the next year, it bounced right back up to the middle of the pack. So I don't know what happened that that one year. Um, so, so that's the first thing to keep in mind is, so we're talking about life satisfaction, and so most Singaporeans are satisfied, or many Singaporeans are satisfied with their lives, and so, so the question is, why is that? I think one of the big factors is, is that we're living in a very uh, economically developed, modernized society, and, and that matters. Um, 
you know, um, you know, the living conditions here are frankly a lot better than they are in other countries in Asia and other countries around the world. Um, so the infrastructure, you know, stability, security, um, you know, so very basic needs, um, you know, which, which don't sound like much, but they're really important, right? Like in very poor countries in Africa where you struggle to find food uh, or you don't feel safe on a daily basis, uh, you know, it, it, those, those people are very unhappy and, and very dissatisfied with their lives, and they should be because the living conditions are terrible. So, so I think that the level of economic development here is an important factor if we're talking about why, as a society, you know, life satisfaction is higher here than in other countries in Asia. Um, the other factor, I think, is social support. Uh, you know, so, so, so there's the, the Singapore Quality of Life study by Tan Baya and, and Tan shows that Singaporeans, uh, on average, are pretty satisfied with their family relationships. Uh, they value family. Um, social support is a huge predictor of well-being. Uh, social relationships are important. Um, and not just because it's important to have people that you can count on when things go wrong, but it's also important to have people that you can enjoy life with, right? Um, like, so, so, so when we're talking about how social relationships are important, it's not, just that, it's not just that happy people have better relationships than unhappy people. When you compare people who are pretty happy with people who are very happy, people who are very happy have even better relationships than people who are, are very happy, right? They spend much more time with their friends and family than people who are still pretty happy, but not like super happy. So, so it, it's important to have people in our lives um, that we can grow old with, that we can enjoy life with. Uh, and, and that goes beyond just the, the support in times of need, which is still important. Um, so I think that's a, an important factor here. Uh, in Singapore, a lot of people feel like they have people that they can count on for support, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, the third thing, this is actually from the, the, the recent World Happiness uh, Report. <laughs> um, so, so the other important factor is, is that um, there tends to be low levels of corruption in Singapore. So, so, so at least when you ask Singaporeans you know, what their perception is of, of the corruption in business and government, um, you know, they, they tend to feel like the, the levels of corruption are very low here. And that's actually something that distinguishes Singapore from other countries in Asia, actually. Um, and, and corruption is, is, is very bad for well-being. Corruption predicts well-being above and beyond income. So even after you control for how much money people make, you know, if you live in a society that's corrupt, that is going to have a negative impact on your society because, you know, if you can't trust... I mean, if you imagine having to bribe... Um, somebody to get the services that you need, or, or living in a country where the police who are supposed to protect you uh, are extorting you for money, right? Uh, then your well-being from day to day is gonna be terrible, right? Um, so corruption is, is an important factor. So, so being able to trust that your government is going to take care of you, is gonna deliver the services that you need, being able to trust that, that you know, if you make a contract, that it's gonna be honored, right? That, that you can do business um, and, and that the laws will be enforced. Um, so, so, so when you compare Singapore to other countries uh, in Asia and other countries around the world, um, you know, that Singaporeans generally feel like they can trust their government and that they can trust business, it, it, it is an important factor in, in understanding their, their well-being. I just now um, just mentioned when I mentioned the difference between um, the Chinese and English speaking uh, communities, I forgot to mention about the interpreting of Kuai Le, which is um, uh, which um, as shown in this uh, graph, you can see that Kuai Le, um, the understanding or interpretation of Kuai Le within the Chinese community, to a certain extent, um, uh, co um, coincides or you know are similar to the English speaking uh, communities in terms of the uh, you know positivity. Um, Kuai Le in the Chinese context can be sometimes associated with negative connotation, and also um, it has also a kind of a focus on the the moment, the instantaneous. Whereas, um, but when people, when Chinese community express their um, opinions towards happiness, they are also quite highly subjective as compared to, and more subjective than English speakers. So from here you can see that, um, um, in fact, if 
for researchers, this is just for your consideration, that in future when you conduct a survey, when you do the translation, you may consider Kuai Le, which is more equivalent to um, Xin Fu, if you want to conduct the survey among the Chinese community. Sorry. Thanks for clarifying, Susan. Right, so Will has also shared with us some of the factors that influence our happiness. So factors like economic prosperity, social relationships, social support, low corruption, they're all important factors that contribute to our happiness. Okay. So additionally, according to the 2017 World Happiness Report, okay, so now I'm going to look at the flip side. Okay. The, the, factor, the single factor that has the biggest impact on misery, so that's the flip side, okay, is actually mental illness. So that is depression and anxiety disorders. Right. So, Wei-Xian, would you be able to tell us what is the state of mental health in Singapore? Are there any, uh, what are the major mental health issues here in this country? Okay, to, to answer that question, I, I will refer to the um, Singapore Mental Health Study, which was published in 2010. I'm not sure how many of you might have come across the findings. It was quite widely publicised when, when the results first came out. So looking at this table, let me just direct you to the red square. Um, is there a pointer? The pointer is... <laughs> okay, so basically... Um, uh, some of the key findings, uh, so a little background about this study, uh, it is a large, very large-scale recent study uh, on, the, on the prevalence of mental illnesses uh, among the adult Singapore resident population. So any adult aged between 15 to 65 years and living in Singapore, whether locals or, or, or uh, sorry, citizens or, or permanent residents. So basically the key findings were um, about 5.8% of the Singapore adult resident population here uh, we have uh, in his or her lifetime 5.8% chance of uh, suffering from major depressive disorder. So to put things in context, if let's say we have approximately 100 uh, persons in this room now, uh, about six of us would have had suffered from depression or will suffer depression in our lifetime. So uh, in terms of proportion, this is about one in 17, one in 17 people. Um, the, the next uh, condition that, that has the highest prevalence uh, as detected in this study was alcohol abuse, about 3.1% or 1 in about 30. And the very close third was uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, about 1 in 32 people or 